Live from ClickOrlando.com, this is News 6 at 5.30. This is a News 6 Plus takeover. Here now is Solutionaries. Welcome to Solutionaries. I'm Lewis Bolden. You know, we all expect to save and set aside money for big expenses like a new car or a down payment on a house. But when we're face to face with an adorable, playful, affectionate puppy, we are not thinking about the actual cost of owning a dog. Routine vet checkups, vaccines, lab tests, maybe even surgery, it can add up fast. So what are the solutions to making sure everyone can get care no matter their finances? Well, there are other options your vet may not be telling you about. Our pets are our best friends, but when they get sick or hurt, we want them to feel better. And sometimes surgery can sound expensive, but we're talking about the spectrum of care. You have more options than you may realize. So little Martha can get the care she needs at the right price. People hear, you know, terms like surgery or MRI, and the, the first thing that goes off in their head is just dollar signs. I really trust them here to say, okay, here's your options. And they're not judgmental at all. He's excited today. <laughs> my primary goals with all of my patients are helping with quality of life and pain management. Up, 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 good boy. I'm Flory Bliss, and I'm a licensed veterinary technician and a certified canine rehab practitioner. I thought that good boy, good boy. I do have patients that come to me after um, an expensive surgery, so post-operative, but a lot of times uh, clients can't afford that, um, and so it's just nice to be able to offer, uh, you know, another solution to that. So. Um, physical rehabilitation is kind of falls under that umbrella of alternative medicine. Still help return them to a mostly normal function so that they can kind of, you know, perform their daily activities. Wilkes is 14. We come to the rehab center twice a month to do exercises and just try to keep him mobile and uh, as happy and able to play as, as much as possible at his age. Good boy. I feel like one day he was able to walk for three or four miles and then the next day he was having struggles and that's when we started going to the vet more often and kind of looking at our options to see what we could do to keep him mobile and stable as long as possible. It's an amazing experience most of the time. I mean, even with my patients that we don't, we're not necessarily returning them to full function. Um, their quality of life is way better. And you can like actually see them gain confidence as they go through the program. And it's just, it's very heartwarming to see. Trying to find alternative methods uh, to surgery. He has had knee surgery in the past, but um, he actually had an issue with his right leg as well. And at his age, surgery really wasn't the best option for him. This one? Yes. Good boy. Huh? Yes. So that's one of the things we work with Florian is just to keep that other leg stable and strengthen it as much as possible. So laser therapy like he's doing now, I know acupuncture is something some people um, do as well. So I think there are other methods um, for, you know, other people's budgets and, and, you know, whatever they feel strongly about. So if you want to just do your physical exam on her and... Um, tell me what you think. Femoral pulse feels good and synchronous. Spectrum of care is something that we've been doing in private practice forever. It basically means talking to people about all of their treatment options and not necessarily just the gold standard treatment options. Good girl. People come to us with all sorts of goals with their animals as well as financial means and so we really um, strive to give them different treatment options. If they're painful you consider cage rest and maybe mm -hmm. a short course of anti-inflammatories just yeah. to see if that can help. Yeah for um, sure. So in terms of spectrum of care 
we want the very best for our patients and for our clients and to protect that human animal bond by providing the very best care. But of course, finances, location, those are all really important considerations. So I think as long as we're giving people all the options and then understanding that gold standard might not be what they're capable of doing for whatever reason and coming up with a plan B, C, D as far as you need to go in order to provide the best care that they're able to offer to their pet. Of course, we'd like to be able to do absolutely everything in the world for our pets, but that's not everybody's reality. It certainly isn't mine. I think it's great to be able to offer different things for people based on their needs. So there are some limitations, though, to all of this. Yes. Talk to me about that. We do mostly non-invasive stuff, so we're kind of doing like manual therapies, like pass range of motion, massage, um, joint mobilization, stuff like that. But there are limitations, and we're not doing the surgeries to stabilize the knees or put a new hip in. So we're, we're really just kind of trying to improve their life as much as we can without doing all those invasive things. That's a good boy. So how do you talk to your vet about other options? They say ask questions and ask if those other options will change the outcome for your pet. Now you also have to talk about if those options will work because there may not be another one that will. Pets are an integral part of our family, so it's important to take into account how much of your budget will go toward caring for your pet over its lifetime. While it's easy to say someone shouldn't have a pet if they can't afford vet care, are we really going to deny companionship for millions of families living paycheck to paycheck? More American households have pets than children, and veterinarians are working harder than ever to keep up with the growing demand. Hey, we got Noodle here. Yeah. All right, awesome. I've got room for you ready for us. Kelly Willis usually gets to work before the sun rises. He's like, I don't know, is it? You want to sniff my stethoscope? She's taking on some of the work traditionally performed by veterinarians. All right, hi, let's come on back, babe. As a certified veterinary technician. The easiest way to explain to people is I'm basically a registered nurse, but for animals, but I do so much more than that. I'm a nutritionist, I'm a behaviorist, I'm a phlebotomist, I'm an x-ray technician. Um, I'm an anesthetist. And Willis's job could be part of a solution for a growing problem facing pet owners. Researchers at Mars Vet Health say a boom in pet adoptions and the loss of about 2,000 vets to retirement each year have combined to create a shortage of veterinarians. They estimate 41,000 more veterinarians will be needed by the year 2030. We searched for solutions at the biggest gathering of veterinarians in the entire country, the VMX convention at the Orange County Convention Center. There are more attorneys in the District of Columbia than there are veterinarians in the entire United States. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bob Lester's group puts on VMX. How many people are applying to vet med school versus how many they can let in? Yeah, the good news is, is the growing love affair with pets. The good news is, there are record numbers of applicants to veterinary schools. The challenge is finding enough seats for them. We checked the University of Florida's College of Veterinary Medicine, and just last year, that school opened up about 30 more seats for students. But out of nearly 2,000 applicants for the program, UF is still only accepting 150 students. Since COVID, the, the pet population has just gone crazy. Dr. Cheryl Good says virtual visits like this one with my dog. Come here, come here. <laughs> he still knows it's the vet. <laughs> are helping some vets meet the rising demand. We can see our patients sooner. You know, they don't have to wait the three or four weeks to come into the mm -hmm. office. Willis says even if demand is high, she's here to help. That's what gets me out of bed is being able to treat my patients and also getting to see medicine work at its finest. You said I did that. Yes. <laughs> it's a good feeling, you know, sense of pride. Researchers say this shortage is concerning, not only because it may create delays in getting to a veterinarian, but some pets may not get health care altogether as a result, and they say that can create a public health issue. More research is being done on this, and we're going to continue to investigate solutions. Right now, there are bills making their way through the Florida House and Senate that would expand access to veterinary care. The Pets Act will allow retired or semi-retired veterinarians who still have a valid license 
to volunteer their services at spay and neuter clinics. It would also allow for virtual pet visits. Lawmakers have until May 5th to get it passed. Still ahead on Solutionaries, finding lost pets using drones. Stories of how people are using this technology to make life-saving rescues. Welcome back to Solutionaries, a show that covers big issues and celebrates people working to make things better. Today, pet ownership. Earlier, we talked about medical bills and the cost of caring for dogs and cats. But what if your pet goes missing? How far would you go to find them? Turns out some people are turning to drone technology as a solution to track down lost pups. All right, pet owners, think about this. You've probably been here before. Your dog is missing. Here, buddy. Where are you? It's been hours. You're worried. Your family's concerned. It's scary. And that pup is nowhere to be found. Well, here's a possible solution. What if you could get a bird's eye view of the area that you're searching? Maybe see some spots that you couldn't see from here at the ground level. And let's put icing on that cake. Go one step further and use thermal imaging to help find your furry friend. It's actually happening right now. I want you to take a look at this video from Central Ohio. It's December and it is cold. Plus, a winter storm with sub-zero temperatures is moving in. Chief Todd May and his team at AFRS, Ohio's first robotic fire department, yes, that's a thing, get a distress call about two missing dogs and dispatched one of their high-tech drones. Well, in that case, the dogs were out for more than 24 hours. There was a lot of predators in the area. The dogs were scared. So the dogs were buried under a, a lot of thicket in a heavily wooded area. If it wasn't for the drone finding their thermal signature, the ground team of 12 individuals probably would have never found those, those pets. It's pretty amazing. Uh, the owner, she was, she was just ecstatic. And she had told us that there's no way we would have ever found those dogs if, if it wasn't for the drone. So it, it, felt, it felt really good. This is Cricket. Cricket, wake up. He's really, really shy. We would not have been able to get near him without salami and everything. And then this is Moko Jumbi. Moko, wake up. Say hello. And I am just so incredibly grateful that he found my dogs because we never would have found them without him. They would have died out there. There's no way that we would have gotten them back. I owe him everything because these dogs are my life. Further north in snowy Ottawa, Canada, a rescue dog named Birdie runs away after coming in from Taiwan. The dog had been on the run for six days. There had been sightings, but she would bolt any time she would see someone. Bring in Dawson Ross. He uses a drone as a hobby and volunteered to help. After days of searching, he sees prints in the snow and fast forward, finds the dog. She was skittish, so they ultimately used a trap to finally catch her and bring her to safety. And in Wisconsin, Matt Howell used his unmanned aircraft to find a dog. See the black spot in the thermal imaging? That is the dog, curled up. He zooms in and then sends the coordinates to the owner. GPS gets them right to the spot. Wait, 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 hold it right there. What you're saying is we could save so many people precious time and potential heartbreak by just equipping them with drones? In that case, why don't we just get an army of drones to find all the missing pets? Not so fast, says Don Wiley, a drone pilot. It's a useful tool. It's not going to be the, the total answer because it really does take a team effort. You're able to put an aircraft in the air. And you get up about 100 feet. You get a nice broad view. You can see behind houses, beside houses as you're flying over. You can see farther out than somebody on the ground. Problem is, though, that even though you can see farther, you can't see under the cars. You get a tree. You can't see under the tree. You can't see in the shade. If you're looking for a dog, a lot of times they're going to be sitting under a tree in the shade. There's other limitations when it comes to using these drones. Well, for one, the battery life is relatively short, so you gotta keep putting it down on the ground and replacing the batteries or recharging it. There's also the issue with restricted airspace, places you can't fly, like near airports or military bases. Plus, on hot days like today, that thermal imaging, the heat-seeking camera, might not work as well because this pavement is warm. That grass is warm. And you know what? The pets are also warm, so everything looks about the same. That's a big problem, especially where we are shooting 
here in Florida. Yeah, there are some organizations working on AI technology to be able to specifically find humans using thermal. Now, that technology is in its infancy, but we're very excited when that will be released. With respect to the drone capabilities, we can fly in the rain, we can fly in the snow, we can fly in freezing temps and up to 40 mile per hour winds. All in all though, the future is bright. Technology is only getting better and drones are getting easier to use. You could say the sky is the limit. For Solutionaries, I'm Vic Michalucci. Let's now address the problem of overcrowding at shelters. Sadly, there are more homeless pets than there are available homes in the U.S. Our producer, Katrina Scales, spoke with a longtime advocate to find out why. So there are a lot of tremendous efforts out there. What we're seeing now are uh, very difficult to place dogs that sometimes end up at shelters, that maybe it's a certain breed. Uh, that isn't easy to place. Uh, large dogs, maybe it's something with older animals that have medical issues. And of course, we still have um, a, a tremendous overpopulation of cats in our shelters. Where the solution to all of this is to get our communities, uh, the organizations in our communities to work closely together. For Florida Animal Friends, that's our total focus. Um, we are, our goal is to, is to help communities to build uh, better spay neuter efforts and we do that through our grant program, which we do on a yearly basis. Um, our funding comes from the sale of vanity license plates through the state. So you can get a beautiful uh, animal friends license plate to put on your car. And part of the proceeds from that, the sale of that plate comes to us where we're able to put that into the grant program to help organizations to do more spay and neuter. Uh, spaying and neutering um, is uh, the sterilization of, of uh, dogs and cats primarily so that they, they don't reproduce. It also um, helps with behavioral issues and health issues down the road. Is it expensive to get them spayed and neutered? It can be, you know, it, it, um, when you look at um, why people don't spay neuter, it used to be that maybe because they wanted to breed their animals and, and you still get a percentage of that, but for the most part, it's usually affordability that, that prevents people from spaying and neutering. Neuter. Whenever a breed becomes popular, that's, this is a big issue. I don't know if you remember the little rascals, but Petey was a, was an, a pit bull. And so for that reason, that used to be a family dog um, in America. Now what's happened is because you have um, uh, the dog fighting uh, industry, and then you also have drug dealers that like, like um, dominant, aggressive dogs. These are the people that sometimes are breeding these animals. When you see, when you go into a shelter and you see litters of puppies, most of them, I mean, it's, it's interesting, a lot of them, are bully, what we call bully breeds. So um, that is that is something that's a real problem um, in, in our Florida shelters today. Now, I do think this, that whenever a breed is popular, you know, it happened with the Doberman and the German Shepherd, um, you're gonna have a percentage of, an, of these animals that are gonna be surplus that'll end up in shelters. And it's not just the pit bull. I, I know that the very popular dog right now is the French Bulldog. And so there's, um, there's all of a sudden, um, a lot of people breeding these dogs, these internet sellers. So, um, and they're cute little dogs, right? But the scenario is, is that a percentage of them are now ending, starting to flood the rescue and the shelter communities. And so we see that too, with even smaller dogs. I always say this, if people are interested in, in getting another animal, the most important thing is to start looking at adoption, go, go to rescue groups, go to check out shelters, uh, don't be in a rush to get an animal. And if you are going to purchase an animal, it's very important that you do it from a responsible breeder. So that that's the primary thing. The other thing is, is looking at ways to help people keep their pets so they don't end up in shelters. There are many uh, good pet owners out there that sometimes maybe through no fault of their own, maybe they're in foreclosure, or it may be um, a situation where you have um, someone that's coming out of a domestic violence situation. They have pets they don't want to leave their home, right, without their pets. Maybe there's ways that we can help those people to keep their animals in their homes instead of having them to be relinquished to shelters or rescues. I like to adopt adult animals. A um, uh, dog I have right now, she came from Mississippi. I don't know what she is. She's a mystery dog, but she's wonderful. And she's probably about 10 years old, perfect for me at my point in life. So the scenario is, is that people need to open their minds and look at the idea that if, if you need an animal, go to a shelter, go to a rescue group, don't give up on them. They may not have something that day or that month, but somewhere along the road, you're going to find the perfect animal for you that's already in a shelter. So that's what we need to be looking at. We are part, all of us are part of the solution. And the minute that um, you start realizing that, that spaying and neutering is not only beneficial for you and your pet, 
but it also impacts um, the many animals out there that are homeless because it gives them an opportunity for um, to be placed in a home. If fostering a pet is something you can do, check out this episode from Florida's Fourth Estate. It is all on the new 6 Plus app for your smart TV. I'm Lewis Bolden. Thanks for watching.